I'm Shelja Patel. I'm a queer Kenyan feminist activist writer, and I'm currently writing about politics and resources and masculinities and how humanity is going to survive the crises we're in. <laughs> All right, uh, that's great. Um, you, uh, uh, you submitted a poem uh, uh, that we've just published at the New Humanitarian. Um, um, what prompted you to write that? What, um, uh, what was the, I mean, why did you decide to do it? I am currently in Italy at an artist's residency. And a couple of weeks ago, floods in northern Italy um, displaced over 20,000 people, killed 14 people. I saw the news of those floods and I instantly identified with the victims because I've experienced flooding in Nairobi, heavy flooding, and I know the devastation that it can cause and the feeling of being displaced from your home by water. What was shocking to me is that I saw the news of the floods in Italy several days before I saw the news of floods happening at the same time in central Somalia that literally put the whole city of Beledwin in central Somalia underwater, displaced a quarter of a million people and killed 22 people. So the fact that I saw front page news about floods in Italy and I didn't see news about floods in Somalia until several days later, obviously got me to think very hard about which areas of the world matter when it comes to climate catastrophe. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you do mention this in your poem about how um, uh, some uh, tragedies in Italy are front page news in Somalia. It's in the development section. Um, why do you think this is the case? Um, I mean, and, and do you think this is a specific incident, uh, instance or generally tragedies in certain places in, in the world tend to be minimized, at least in coverage? Um, and, and is this just, just coverage within the West or how do you think it works? It's about where news is produced and what are considered the global distribution centers of news. You are much more of an authority on that than I am. And certainly to date, I think there's we're now seeing some shifting. The global centers of news have been the US and we have editors there deciding what constitutes world news. So it's about proximity, it's about capital, and it is of course about white supremacy and which lives are considered grievable, which deaths are considered tragedies and which deaths are considered statistics. So deaths on the African continent, deaths on the Asian continent, they're just considered statistics. They're reported as 100 people died. Deaths in Europe and the US are human tragedies and they're seen as lives that people can identify with and they're covered as human interest stories. Right. Um, just to push that uh, a bit, do you think um, that reporting, um, uh, I mean, oh, and, and how we see um, tragedies in the West, you know, um, uh, as, as people in the global South, as people in, in Africa or in Asia, um, do we see them differently than when the same thing happens um, uh, to us here? I mean, as an East African in Italy, Italy is a former colonial power. Does that impact how you see tragedies there? I think we are all products of a world shaped by colonialism. So it takes work to shed our own colonial structure, our own colonial thinking, our own colonial conditioning. I notice, for example, that we're in the habit of saying often on the African continent when something is happening right there, nobody is talking about this, meaning right. the West is not talking about it, <laughs> meaning Western media outlets are not 
talking about it, but we are not nobody. We are talking about it. And we are so used to decentering ourselves and marginalizing ourselves that we don't even recognize that we're doing it. So we have to unlearn our own internalized marginalization, our own internalized habits of centering discourse from elsewhere instead of centering ourselves and our own um, telling of our narratives. I think it's also really important to note that the way that we look at tragedy in the global north is often shaped by our own sense of helplessness. So there's a way in which it is easier for us to think about, for example, Black Lives Matter. In Kenya, it's easier to get angry and righteous and feel a sense of you know, a sense of rage around police murders of young black men in the US when we know that Kenyan police kill up to a dozen young men every week in the informal settlements of Nairobi, when we know about the tremendous police violence that has occurred around every electoral cycle. And somehow we don't want to consider that because it makes us feel helpless. It brings us up against our own structures of privilege and the ways that we rely on that violence to protect the, the comfort of our own lives. So we we also have a lot of internal work to do. Right. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, just thinking about how things are, are reported, uh, I mean, in international discourse um, uh, or reporting on humanitarian affairs, there, they, they don't. They, there is a tendency to paint humanitarian tragedies as only happening in certain places, um, at least the ones that we there needs to be international responses uh, are too. And I'm wondering whether there is a, an, uh, a sense in which. Um, uh, when we say they're not talking about us, we're buying into uh, into that. And in fact, the insistence that, you know, we need to be on their screens, you know, um, uh, as victims, should it be the other way that they also need to be on their screens um, uh, uh, as victims of this, uh, 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 as, uh, um, sort of as, as people who are experiencing this impact. And I'm thinking specifically in the sense that there's this idea that climate change will only impact certain areas. You know, yes. global south of the guys are going to suffer, you know. And, and I think that perhaps maybe if we were to actually show, okay, it's going to impact all of us. You know, it's already impacting all of us. You know, that there mm -hmm. might be an actual push to change um, how things are rather than simply sequestering it in, in the global south. I don't know what you think about that. I could not agree more. Um, recent studies by Oxfam have shown that the global, the richest 10% in the world collectively produce more emissions than the po poorest 50% in the world. And that's not just the 10% in Europe and America, it's the 10% um, in Brazil, in China, in India, in Nigeria, in South Africa. So as the economist Joythi Ghosh puts it, it's not us against us in the global south against countries in the global north. It's the global 90%, all of us against the collective rich. And there's no moral imperative for the colonized or the formerly colonized to empathize with their former colonizers. But there is a political imperative for the 99% on the planet to organize transnationally, because the 1% are always in solidarity with each other. Their solidarity is not with the people in the countries they live in or the people who share their skin color or name or nationality. It's with the interests of capital. They are always organizing and consolidating to protect their own interests. And in the last 15 years, the emissions of the richest 10% of the planet have increased exponentially by 15%, and the emissions of the poorest 50% on the planet have actually dropped 
So they are literally cannibalizing the rest of us. They are literally gobbling up the the future of the planet at our expense, and we are all disposable to them. Right. Um, just follow up on that. So in, in your poem, I think you mentioned that we are all in the same boat. Um, uh, but we need to be not necessarily, I think, in the same ocean, um, uh, but we need to be a bit more porous. So I'm wondering, what does that sentence actually mean? Um, um, I was a bit sort of struck by it, but what did you mean to, we need to be more porous, in what sense? Well, the actual lines of the poem are, we are not all in the same boat. We're not even in the same ocean, but we can choose to stay porous. And some of us are literally in boats. Just this year alone, over 400 people, African refugees have drowned in the Mediterranean. Last year, over 900 African refugees drowned trying to cross the Mediterranean in boats to get to Europe. Since 2014, 29,000 migrants trying to reach Europe in boats have died. So, the boat is a literal material reality for many, many people. What I mean by we can choose to stay porous is that we can actually see where we have common interests, where we can be in solidarity, where displaced people in Somalia can feel their common humanity with displaced people in Northern Italy and reach out across national borders this is what we're doing at the COP conferences when climate activists from around the world gather and try to hold the, the ruling classes and the 1% of this planet to carbon emission ceilings. On a more local level, one of my heroes in Italy is Domenico Lucano. He was the mayor of a tiny town called Riacci in Calabria, an impoverished region of Italy. And in 2021, he was imprisoned for 13 years for the crime of welcoming and integrating over 500 African refugees to his town. He revitalized the local economy. He repopulated this town that had been depopulated. He created a model for how we could actually do climate crisis and transnational migration. And for that, he was criminalized, and he's now serving a 13-year jail sentence under the right-wing government of Giulia Meloni, which is the most right-wing Italian government since Mussolini. So we have on the ground, we have ordinary working-class people, we have political activists, we have visionaries on every continent who actually understand that our world is livable and shareable. We don't have to be in competition for scarce resources, we can actually build human communities based on shared human values. And then we have the fascists and the rising tides of fascism and the fascist parties and movements all over the planet. And they are in alliance with the global 1% because they want to protect the interests of capital. So it is very clear that it is those of us who want a livable, shareable planet and if we can stay porous and stay open and curious and human, then we can keep asserting that vision against those who have rejected humanity. Right. Um, you you say in, in, in your poem, you suggest that these are not considered uh, topics for poetry. Uh, you, know, you say save it for the open. Um, so... Do you think that um, poetry, the arts, um, um, have a role to play in actually getting people to appreciate um, what's going on and uh, 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 the ways in which they can actually change it? Well, we're having this conversation because I sent you a poem. So yes, I do believe, I want to believe, and obviously I am biased because poetry is my medium, I want to believe that poetry has a way of snaking through our defenses, that it can enter us through the heart and the gut and open us to seeing things that we wouldn't otherwise see and feeling things that we would otherwise defend ourselves against feeling. And once we see and once we feel, then we have access to our larger humanity. 
I want to believe that poetry can make us braver, that it can make us larger. Obviously, it doesn't always work. And obviously, if poetry could save us, we wouldn't be in this crisis that we're in. But right now, we need to draw on everything we have. Poetry, science, music, economics, we have to grab every tool available to us because the window for the survival of humanity on the planet is narrowing extremely fast. All right, so one final question, um, and, and this is to bring it back to uh, uh, the, the, the poem, the coverage. Um, how better do you think, or what can media, international media, both in uh, the West and uh, in the rest, um, what can they, how can they better cover humanitarian issues, humanitarian crisis, humanitarian disasters, and, and, and the lead up to them and the causes of them? How can, how can they do better? I think the simplest answer is allocate resources equitably. Again, you're the authority on this, but you know that the amount of resources in terms of jobs available, bureaus, um, time, you know, media time and column inches and space devoted to news in the global north is exponentially higher than what's made available to for news from the global south. So simply changing those structures, ensuring that there's an equal number of reporters covering news on the African continent as there is covering news in Europe, allocating resources just on the basis of geographical area, for example, if we actually looked at the per capita reportage and journalistic coverage of different areas of the world, we'd see the enormous inequity. Um, the second thing I think is simply is to break down the corporate control of media. We really need to start talk differentiating between corporate media and independent media, because right now media in the global north is controlled by five big corporations and they are serving the interests of capital, the interests of advertisers and the interests of owners. Um, some of them are owned by billionaires, and so they are obviously not going to cover news that challenges the interests of those billionaires. Right. Um, I, I, I've got to add in one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm, 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 I'm interested in this idea of audiences and who they write for, who the media writes for. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that because it seems a lot of times that uh, what we call international media, which is essentially Western media, um, writes reports for Western audiences. You know, mm -hmm. even though the audiences tend to be global, everybody you know attunes it towards CNN or or BBC. Is there a way you think uh, that we we can craft either through international or Western press? Um, uh, a media that works for pretty much everybody, or do you think it should be the job of African media uh, or media in the global south um, to provide coverage for um, uh, uh, African or, or global south audiences? Um, and especially when you think about covering events not just in the global south, how do they get to cover events in Italy, for example? You know, the flooding in Italy, etc. What do you think? I think it's both and. You know, you've been doing this work for decades and you've been deconstructing Western media for decades. So you're actually the, the person I would look to to answer that question. But we need, you know, we're seeing in the US, for example, that you've got this, it's basically a, a bloodbath in terms of the, the folding and the shutting down of local newspapers and local media. Um, and so the, the shrinking of reportage of local news um, from local communities is horrifying and the implications for what then constitutes the news and whose interests it serves. 
And so we need decentralized media that is local, that is community based, that is internationalist in its coverage. And we need equity. We need global media equity that ensures stories from all over the world are treated as equally important and lives on every continent are treated as equally important. Um, I love what's happening with the continent, for example, um, in Africa and what's happening with African journalism um, and initiatives to center African voices in African journalism. And so I think that's a, a really good place to start in terms of what media we consume so that we stop saying no one's talking about this. And we say we're talking about this and we're going to get our news from here instead of from there.